Hey folks, Joseph Sabora here. In honor of the horror writer and director Wes Craven, who's no longer with us sadly, I decided to review a favorite of mine that came out on October 10th, 1986, which sad to say was a critically and commercial failure at the box office. Yeah, due to their its troubled production values, I mean they really had a lot of things going wrong with the film that they had to work on. You had so many reshoots, you know, re-editing all the pacing that they went into, you know, having to um, add in all the gore scenes, you know, change half of the, the story that the characters were, were supposed to be focusing on, not to mention adding a new ending to the film. It was actually based on a novel by Diana Hensdale yeah, which is the title of the film, Deadly Friend. This was a film that um, I actually saw uh, when I was a little kid. I, I remember my father taping this on Select TV. I still have the VHS recording of it. So, yeah, just like all the other recordings that I had from from his tapes. <laughs> um, but yes, this movie had been released on DVD back in 2007. It's been eight years ago, as of now. It was part of the Trista Terra collection. It was in widescreen. Yep. And it's also um, the uncut version of the film, which shows a lot of extended scenes, you know, involving the, the gory deaths of, of Sam's uh, father and a neighbor lady named uh, Elvira Parker. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's probably the most gruesome scenes I ever saw when, when I was a kid. But I never thought I would see, you know, almost a little longer than the than the one I saw in, in the theatrical version. Yeah, that sadly was criminally underrated, and I know it's been um, virtually disowned by Wes Craven himself, along with uh, writer Bruce Joe Rubin, you know, the same writer who went on to do Ghost and Jacob's Ladder. Yeah, hard to believe because, I mean. Between his uh, screenplay, you know, he wanted to come up with something sort of like a uh, the tradition of the movie uh, John Carpenter's Starman, and that's what I read somehow, where it, it just seems like it was going to go for a different approach, except it was mostly, you know, a science fiction thriller um, with a mix of, you know, Romeo and Juliet meets um, the Frankenstein movies. In that sort of way, yeah. and, and the fact that they had good chemistry with, between Matthew uh, Labardeau from the TV show uh, Little House on the Prairie, along with Wiz Kids and all this other stuff that he's been in, yeah, and Christy Swanson in her first starring role, you know, after her uh, screen debut in uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off when she was a young teenager, a very young teenager. And very pretty too, yeah. Because she later went on to do other films after that. And yeah, I, I I was actually amazed when I saw this movie. Um, I just really did not understand the hate that this film went into. And and the fact that they disowned it because of the studio Warner Brothers, whose vice president at the time, Mark Candon, decided to added more scenes to it to to make this movie even bloodier. And gorier than ever before because the guy actually understands uh, Craven's uh, original work that he did. I mean, yes, because he also had a bad history of actually, you know, editing all these uh, gory scenes in order to avoid an X rating. Yeah. They also hired uh, editor uh, Michael Eliot, the same editor who went on to edit all these two films uh, that came out. Uh, a few years later, called uh, Alfred Justice, the Steven Seagal movie by John Flynn, and Showdown in Little Tokyo, yeah, a criminally underrated uh, martial arts and action thriller that that stars uh, Dolph Lundgren and the late great, uh, which this was his first role, surprisingly enough, Brandon Lee. Yeah, which I know both of these films actually. Run at a short running time, 
although you know showdown in little tokyo had only 79 minutes yeah that's incredibly fast paced and very short yeah it's such a shame though because i would have loved to see an original cut or even the as well as the director's cut of the same movie for deadly friend and yeah that's why uh, all their fans actually wanted to um, see this movie for themselves because you know it's been you know it hasn't been uh, shown to the public you know ever since and and we, you know we already waited eight years after its DVD release uh, you know back in 2007 so. and now that craven has gone I think it's time that this movie finally gets its release it deserves and let's hope it does uh, if Shell Factory uh, gets a chance to buy the rights to this movie. I mean, they already bought the rights to uh, Nightbreed, yeah, another Warner Brothers uh, title under uh, Morgan Creek. So why not? So let's let's see what happens. But anyway, let's get back to the film. It stars Matthew Labrador, Christy Swanson, Michael Charette, and May, Richard Marcus, Anne Ramsey, you know, from The Goonies, and later from Mama from the Train, Lee Paul, Charles Fletcher, who does the voice of BB the Yellow Robot, yep, and he later went on to do um, the voice of Roger Rabbit in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. He was also in the movie A Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, where he played a doctor, so that's cool. Russ Moran and Andrew Operto. Yep, it's written by Bruce Joe Rubin and it's directed by Wes Craven. The movie begins set in the parking lot of a local burger joint called Burger Heaven. We spot a thief who tries to steal from a band until a yellow robot named BB, who's voiced by Charles Fletcher, stops him by grabbing his throat and let go just as soon as a young genius named Paul Conway, who's played by Matthew LeBurr, and his mother, Jenny, who's played by Ann Toomey, which they all returned from shopping and drove away in a band. BB the Robot, of course, was the owners of Paul, who he built from scratch after taking robotics or so. They arrive at a new house in a town called Welling, and soon becomes friends with a paper boy named Tom Toomey who's played by Michael Charette. Paul has a university scholarship at Polytech due to his intelligence and interest in neurology, yeah, which is the study of the brain, and artificial intelligence, you know, which is robotics and all that. Yeah. Studying of robots and everything. And electronics. BB of course, um, wants to plug in himself into the electric socket to charge up um, at their new home, you know, trying to move back away from the piano. But once they arrive at the university, Paul Jenny and BB had met a professor named Dr. Johansson, who's named by Russ Moran, who gives him a tour of Paul's new laboratory. So a few days later, Paul and BB decided to clean the yard until he meets his next door neighbor, a pretty girl named Samantha Pringle was played by Chrissy Swanson. Suddenly he noticed some of the bruises of her arm which Samantha, or simply Sam, tries to hide because we then spotted um, her alcoholic and abusive father yeah, and a complete asshole as we speak named Harry who's played by Richard Marcus and that particular night Samantha visits Paul and Janine just to give him a housewarming gift. You know, at this rate, you know, she was going to make uh, a cake, but it turns out it was just this cookies. Then her father drags Samantha home and beats her, you know, abusively. Which then leads to uh, one of the huge nightmares, and yes, this is one of those nightmares that's, that Sam has. Was when um, <clears throat> her father tries to... Uh, attack her in her bedroom and then then soon uh, she started uh, grabbing the base and sticking it into his chest and that's when all the blood starts to come right out 
yeah, squirting all over, over her in, in the bed, you know, in, in a very frightened scene, yeah. And then when she woke up, he, she tries to, um, you know, lock the door by putting a chair underneath, you know, because you can tell how frightened she really looks. I don't blame her, though, man. I mean, that guy was a fucking ass. Anyway, Tom helps Paul teach BB how to deliver newspapers, where they stop at a house of a paranoia old lady named Elvira Parker, who's played by Ann Ramsey, wants to threatening the boys by using a double barrel shotgun and express his dislikes for BB. So they soon walk away, only to reveal that his father is a security guard at a university hospital. Yeah, for Tom, that is. They walk further by accounting a motorcycle gang that's led by a biker punk bully named Carl, who's played by Andrew Roberto. So after Carl pushes Paul onto the garbage bags, BB of course grabs um, Paul's crouch and the game rides away with Carl bowing for revenge, which I know he does later on. So then Paul, Samantha, Tom, and BB had developed a close friendship with each other by playing basketball in the neighborhood, which then they accidentally toss onto a virus porch, which she wants up uh, taking the ball and and put her inside the house, you know, refusing to give it back to him. But of course, BB's eyes wants a freezing on a viver, as you know, he'll never forget what just happened. Yeah, because this is going to be, as we speak, the revenge. But it gets even worse when, on Halloween night, Samantha comes over with a bloody nose and asks for ice. Paul and Jenny believes that her father is abusing her. Yep, which Samantha wants up going out with Paul, Tom, and BB just to pull a prank on Elvira by trying to get the, the basketball. So then BB unlocks her gate and Samantha rings the doorbell, which then suddenly the alarm goes off as they hide in the shrubbery. And this is the scene where it really choked me up completely because I did not want to see this happening. But Elvira actually spotted BB and wants up using the shotgun and shot him completely. He was very devastated that he really lost a, a friend that he built. He was really devastated to see that scene too because I don't like seeing robots getting you know, shot down this way. It's kind of like what happened in, in the movie, uh, you know, Short Circuit, yeah, you know, one and two. Yeah, you know, we we never want to see a robot getting, you know, destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> funny because this movie came out uh, you know, after Short Circuit. So anyway, uh, on Thanksgiving, Paul Jenny eats dinner with Samantha, which I know that's where they're starting to pray to God about what's going to happen next. And then Paul and Samantha had shared their first kiss with each other just as soon as you know Samantha returns home late at night, which that means this is the worst part of all. Her father became so outrageous that he actually punches her and pushes down the stairs, which causes her to get knocked unconscious and was rushed into the hospital. Yeah, which is only left brain dead. So Dr. Johansson told Paul that he would be put on life support for 24 hours. And then that is until the plug will be pulled. So Paul decided that the best idea to, to save her life was to use BB's microchip that links to artificial intelligence with a human brain by running to Tom's house as he owns BB for, for having him getting shot in the first place since that prank with Elvira that has gone completely wrong. He asked him for his father's keys to the hospital to sneak into Samantha's room and bring her back to life when the plug is pulled. Yeah, just after they tried to, to put in some sedative inside Janine's uh, coffee cup, they wind up getting the keys to enter the house as Tom deactivates the hospital power from the basement. And Dr. Johansson actually pulls the plug on Samantha really early, you know, as you know, her father demands. Then suddenly the hospital goes dark, and when Paul enters Samantha's room, and drags her to his lab. Paul inserts the Michael trip inside Samantha's brain and uses his remote control to attempt to activate Samantha. 
that's when we spotted her movements, uh, when we started spotting her foot. Yeah, and that's what caused Tom to faint. So then Paul takes Samantha to the shed of his house and activated her completely. She opens her eyes mechanically and starts to breathe with her hands in the positions of of BB's uh, pincers as Paul teaches to sit up. Yeah, because she's doing that, uh, <laughs> the Balkan sign. Yeah, sort of like the the ones that the BB was catching. And just moving around like this. And sort of, of course, he even spotted her face, you know, looking very pale too. You know, since this is sort of the afterlife of Samantha. You know, lots of blue that's spreading on her eyes and her neck too. Yeah, it's, it's just devastating to see her this way. So then the police arrive at Samantha's house and inform that Harry, that her body has disappeared. And in the middle of the night, Paul finds Samantha staring at a window, looking at her father, which, you know, Paul deactivated her. But then the next morning, Paul awakens to see that Samantha is gone. As he tries to search for her in the streets, he had no sign of her completely. But then suddenly, Samantha was at her house and winds up getting her revenge by actually uh, going downstairs of the basement and surprisingly enough, kills um, her father by pushing him down the stairs, you know, grabbing him and breaking his hand. Then actually picks him up uh, near the furnace, and she actually breaks his neck. And after that, she actually puts uh, her father's head inside the furnace, so it's all burned completely. Yeah, and that's when Paul actually finds her in the cellar with her father's corpse. And then horrified as he is, he hides the body in a pile of coal. And then goes home with Samantha by locking her in his bedroom. So then, that night, Samantha breaks free again, only this time, she gets another revenge on Oviver for shooting BB. So then, Oviver calls the police, but winds up being hanged up after waiting too long. Then suddenly, in slow motion, a basketball bounces ominously in her living room, which indicated that Samantha had broken in, which she did. And this is the scene that became so gruesome, and I know a lot of people remember this. It's where Samantha appears and threw her at the wall of her living room. Yeah, a virus screams, and then suddenly Samantha throws a basketball at her head, causing her head to explode. And then all the blood starts to shoot up you know, from her head. And then, yeah, then his body laid down to the rest as it stumbles and... You know, while blood is still squirting from the floor. Yeah, very messed up scene too. But I gotta say, it was really cool that this was all done in practical effects. Yeah, I actually heard that Craven did use cow brains for that shot of, of mixing in with the uh, the head of Avira that they just created. It's, it's just really amazing the way they did it though. <laughs> so then after that... Uh, when Tom learns that Samantha was killing people, yeah, you know, they actually broke the secret once Paul was trying to introduce to Samantha inside um, his attic. He actually escapes and, and plans to call the police, but then suddenly they were both getting into a fight as he's trying to leave the house. Yeah, because we also found out that that he has that Paul hasn't been at school, you know. Since uh, Janine had found out from from his professor, so then uh, Samantha jumps out of the window and attacks Tom, but Paul and Janine tries to save him. But as soon as Samantha runs away, yeah, she almost choked Paul after telling her to stop. Uh, Paul actually runs after her, but then Kyle confronts him as the police car arrives. That is till you know. After Carl started to beat the shit out of Paul, Samantha wants already, you know, hearing the words that's echoing BB. <laughs> yeah, because you can actually hear the uh, BB's voice in the mix. So, Samantha actually uh, screams BB as he grabs uh, Carl 
and froze them into the car's windshield, which it actually killed them completely. As she runs up, she was confronted by the police, making her way back to Paul's shed, where Paul meets her there, and then she tries to comfort her. That's when we started to find out that Samantha was becoming more human, just as soon as we started seeing her robotic vision you know, from BB. So it starts to change after that. So then that's when she started screaming, Paul? But it gets even worse when the police finally arrive at point at Paul. You know, once uh, Samantha yells Paul's name again. Yeah, and this is, and this one really got to me too. It was then the police actually wants up uh, going straight to uh, to Samantha. And this one Paul was trying to stop him from shooting her. The gun actually went straight to her stomach, and it and it actually blasted. Yeah. Then suddenly Samantha dies in his arms. This is what leads to the final climax, which I know this is the the scene that I know Wes Craven, you know, and maybe the audience themselves, even Bruce Joe Wilburn himself, hated because they didn't want to change the ending completely. That's where we find out that Samantha was in the morgue with Paul trying to go inside just to get Samantha out of there until all of a sudden Samantha's arms actually grabbed his neck and her face rips apart only the revealing oh you're gonna believe this a terrifying variation of BB but with Samantha's voice yeah a very cheesy look of of that uh, particular robot because you couldn't forget and then you know her arms of course rips apart you know, already, you know, breaking free from her grip, and she snaps his neck, and, and she just says, Paul, come with me. Yeah, and that's where we get to hear the, sort of a rap song, if you think about it. And I, I love the music, too, that they use, the, the score, which is actually done by uh, Charles Bernstein. He did a good job, too. Um, yeah, this, this song, of course, was sort of the the rap version of BB, you know, basically you just keep hearing BB, 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 <laughs> And I didn't think this movie wasn't that bad. I mean, I've seen worse horror films out there that tries its subject. I mean, hell, you know, Craven had a bad film that came out in 2010 called My Soul to Take, and Tell me on this one, which is worse, this movie or my soul to take? Yep, here's your answer. Because I thought this was actually a very well-made uh, story, you know, about uh, a boy who just moved to a new town. She meets the girl next door, yeah, and they they tend to fall in love, even though you know they want to having a close relationship with you know, his buddy, the paper boy. And of course, um, you know, Paul's trusty robot, BB, you know. I thought it worked together, but I kind of wish uh, we had seen more of that in the film. You know, where you actually get to see them, you know, having fun, you know, you know playing basketball like, like they did in the film. And maybe go around, you know, doing whatever they want. You know, until all the bad things starts to happen later on in the film. Yeah, it would have made this movie even longer instead of its running time you know, of 91 minutes um, but I, I definitely love the chemistry between Matthew and Christy completely I mean it it definitely shows some spark right there you know Christy is was such a pretty young actress at the time and, you know she's still beautiful today by the way and she always remembers these moments you know when, when she was young you know th this was a rising star from her to wind up becoming you know, more famous and she is a very underrated actress too. You know, I, I really enjoy her work in movies like uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which later became a TV series. You know, The Chase with Charlie Sheen. And, uh, not to mention she was in the sequel to Mannequin. Yeah, I thought that was good too. I mean, you know, in spite of its flaws. Um, but yeah. I mean, I just wish this movie got credit it deserves. I mean, it, it should deserve more viewings uh, from its uh, fans. And 
And more importantly, this movie... I hope this movie does get a Blu-ray release from Shelf Factory or, or any other company. Maybe Warner Bros. might take a chance at it, but who knows. Because that way, you know, this movie will look really good in HD. And, and we'll probably get to see more special features and all this other stuff that... Yeah, you know, maybe some new interviews with, with some of the cast of, of the film. That would be awesome, too. Because I would love to... To have access to see the you know the original versions and the director's cut and all all this other stuff, yeah, it, it would be uh, a true honor because that was, as we speak, a brilliant, great film. I also love the music score that they chose to, you know, it, it it definitely has the feel of of the music that you heard in A Nightmare on Elm Street and all this other stuff that that Craven does, it, it has that particular feel. The synthesizers that I'm, I'm familiar with. Yeah. Stuff you hardly hear anymore these days in horror movies. But man, I, I just didn't want to see, you know, Samantha, you know, getting killed too. And so was BB the robot. I mean, it was just so devastating to see them, you know, you know, get abused by her. Or completely asshole fodder, you know. And I'm just so happy that you know Samantha finally gets her revenge on him. Yes, you know, yeah, the way you know, the way he treated her. It's just, yeah, I know. I was like right there, and I know. I mean, that gruesome scene, you know, with the basketball, you know, with her actually throwing the basketball at her head was what really got to me too, because they really had some awesome uh, practical effects that they use by showing the head exploding. This is why movies nowadays should have practical effects these days. They don't need to be cheesy, but they should make them more realistic in that sort of way, so it makes it more as gruesome as ever before. Yeah, that's that's what makes this movie more scarier than ever. Oh, but it also had a great cast, too. I'm, I, I definitely love Charles Fletcher doing the voice of BB, you know, giving that robotic voice of of his that he chose for the role, saying "bb bb 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 Yeah, I'm I'm trying to do that voice too. <laughs> yeah, because most of the times he just he just says "bb" and then and then he comes up with other uh, all these uh, radical robotic voices of his and the movements that he does, and he's also very smart. You know, he can actually you know use the combination of the gates and all of that that he went oh man I, I wish I had a robot like that you know like BB and or, or any other kind it, you know it's, it's always sweet to have someone that you built that that you just want to have um, in your own house that can actually do anything you want you can even tell them to do whatever they want you know, such as cleaning your room you know fixing things you know, do everything the way humans do. Everything like that. You know, <laughs> it'd be fun. It's hard to believe because this was the year when we started getting a lot of movies that involved robots. You know, we had movies like Choppy Mall, where we had these kill bots. You know, as security guards, who wants up going on a killing spree. And then we had, of course, Short Circuit. <laughs> yeah, a movie. About uh, an artificial intelligence robot, sort of in the tradition of E.T. for that matter. A robot with personality. And that's what I love about that. And then, of course, we had other robots, like the one that we had in the movie Space Camp. And also the robot who's the, the navigator in the Flight of the Navigator. Yeah, wow. Oh, that must have been a very good year when it comes to that. Yeah, because I guess they were into that technology that we're having. Yeah, I, I know a lot of 80s movies were getting that too, you know, focusing more on, on technology that, as we speak, you know, robotics and everything. You know, it's just, it just makes you want to, you know, study and, you know, create your own robots, do everything. So you can do whatever you want. So I like that. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it sort of has the real genius vibe to it as well, you know, as someone mentioned. A very underrated film, by the way, with Bell Kilmer. It's worth watching. Uh, I hope that this movie, you know, 
gets its release someday, and I hope I can buy that film someday too. So, so that way, you know, this movie will finally get its treatment it deserves. So anyway, I give Deadly Friend four stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.